Good morning, everybody. It's good to uh, be with you all again in this manner, in this way. Uh, God has uh, allowed us another another week of uh, being able to come together for our prayer time and also for our Bible study. And so we're grateful for this means uh, that has been provided for us that allows us to stay connected uh, to the Word of God. Uh, I often say it, and I think I just say it with due respect when I say that. You know, I know sometimes the, uh, the issue is, is for us to see one another or to see who's talking. Uh, when the Bible clearly says faith comes by what? Hearing the word of God. Not necessarily seeing, but we are grateful for this opportunity. Of course, there are some who are listening by way of the other conference call. And we're grateful to, uh, to those of you that have uh, called in and are participating in this manner. I certainly want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Sister Mary Jane Johnson who is on the line pretty much every week with us. And so we're grateful for uh, her uh, continued participation uh, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. As always, anytime we uh, start on Wednesday morning, we always start with prayer. And uh, I am asking for us to continue praying for uh, uh, Barbara Matthews uh, and her family. The uh, services for her father, Carlton Wilson, is going to be this coming weekend. Of course, we know that there is the, uh, the 10 people rule that is still being kept uh, that service is actually going to be at um, uh, at the funeral home. I'm going to give you more details about it. I think she's going there today just to make sure that everything is, is absolutely set. And so I'm not going to give any, any more detail about that other than the fact I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be on Saturday. As soon as we know that, we'll give out a word to make sure that you get all the information um, and continue praying for the family. For Yancine Robeson, uh, her father, Willie White, his service is actually going to be this uh, Friday, but everything is going to be at Houston Memorial Garden at 11:30 uh, a.m. And so it's a graveside service that they're doing. Uh, many of us know we can't participate um, uh, in those endeavors, but let's certainly make sure we're keeping those family in those families in our prayer. We want to, uh, I want to just let them know, you know, by way of sending a text, by way of a call, uh, whatever it is that we can do, it's still okay for us to. Um, cook a little something, bring it to person. Uh, we're still applying social distancing. We don't have to touch each other when we do those kinds of things. So let's keep that in mind. Again, we still want to do what we do as a church in support of one another, even in the midst of uh, the, uh, the pandemic uh, issue that we are currently dealing with. So would you bow with me for a moment as we go to uh, our awesome God in prayer. God, we know Again, that you are absolutely awesome. Not only are you awesome, but you're brilliant in everything that you do. You are a caring God who gave us Christ who was crucified on a cross. God, you are dependable. You're excellent in every way. You are our faithful Father. You are a gracious God. You are holy, high, and lifted up. Yes, God, we uh, recognize that you are infinite in everything that you do. You are Jesus. You're just. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the merciful Messiah. You are the one who is always necessary. We always need you. You are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent all at the same time. You are our Prince of Peace. Yes, that's who you are. And then, God, we, uh, we, we, we pause in, in this way to say thank you again for allowing us the privilege of being able to confess our sins before you, knowing again you said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and that you cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. So, Lord, we count on that forgiveness and we count on that cleansing on a daily basis. You told us uh, when we were to pray that, we were to say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, those who trespass against us. So, Lord, we count on your forgiveness on a daily basis. And so, uh, with that in mind, as we bow before you, we do so with interceding on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are going through still their seasons of tough times. We do pray for uh, Barbara uh, Matthews and her family. Uh, God, who have to bury our father this coming weekend. Uh, we know the sorrow that can be attached to that. So we pray again your peace that surpasses understanding that it would guard their hearts and their minds uh, through Christ Jesus. We pray for Yancine and her family uh, and the loss of death of her dad, God. Um, and we just pray again that you would continue to keep them as only 
as only you can. We know the big word today is COVID-19, the coronavirus, but uh, these persons were not in any way afflicted, uh, affected uh, by the virus. We still know we live in a fallen world, God, and so uh, we know that we are not yet at the point of no more tears and no more sorrow, and so we, we, uh, we know that we can count on your help uh, to help us through these, uh, these difficult times. And so again, we ask your grace and your mercy. And for those uh, persons who are still having to bury loved ones as a result of COVID-19, God, we, uh, we lift those persons before you. And just, God, just ask again that you would have mercy. Some, uh, some tragic situations taking place, in some cases not being able to see that person again, uh, saw them once and didn't see them again. So, Lord, I just pray that in your own way, God, in your own way, however you choose to do it, that you would show your mercy because we know it does endure forever. And so even as we stand today, we are still mindful of our own Sister Betty Savannah, and we ask again for your peace in her life, Lord, for, for Viesta and Mary Wyatt, for Lee Williams and Philomena Thomas, for Otto Smith, uh, Brother James Leonard and Sister Leonard, for Carol, for Henry, for Almira, for Paul Lee, for Herman, for Gordon, Nell, Doris, Milton, Clifford, Carolyn, Clyde, Ella, and Brother Callahan and his wife. You know what his wife is experiencing now. Uh, her health is uh, 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 going down, God. But we know, again, you got all power, and we know you can heal. So we're asking in Christ's name that you would provide that healing as only you are able to do, Father. Uh, we, we clearly know there are so many others that are going through. So we pray again that you would always help us to lift our he heads to the hills from what's coming our help, knowing that all of our help ultimately comes from you, God. We, we, we need you, Father, and we need you every minute. We need you every moment. We need you every nanosecond of our life. And so we thank you for the recognition of our need for you. So people all over the world, whether it's on Antarctica or whether it's Asia, whether it's Australia, uh, we pray again for, for people everywhere, all over the world. For those in North America, South America, those in Europe, we just pray again your grace and your mercy continue to be upon each and every one of us. This world is in desperate need for your saving, the saving grace of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray again for salvation of souls, for people who may not know you, God, still in the guilt of their sin. We pray that the gospel might be shared, not just the fear of the virus, but the gospel of Jesus Christ might be shared where people who don't know you can come to faith in, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, help us who are believers to know that the harvest is truly ripe, uh, but you declare that the laborers are few. Help us uh, to be the laborers that you've called to go out even in this harvest to share the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. Social distancing, uh, but it doesn't stop us from having our mask on and still share the gospel with somebody that needs to hear the Lord G about the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now, Lord, in our study the book of Philippians, we pray again that you will get the glory out of what we say and do in this day. For we pray it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, once again, as we do know, uh, Good Shepherd, we are, uh, we, this past month, uh, in this particular month, I'm sorry, uh, we read the, uh, the book of Esther, we read the book of Ruth. Uh, this week, uh, up until, I guess, well, today, we're going to be reading uh, in the, uh, or tomorrow, I'm sorry, the, uh, the book of Philippians, and so if you haven't read it yet, it's still an opportunity for you to do that. Uh, and then once we're done with Philippians, we're going to read for 31 days the Proverbs. And I pray and trust that we're still staying engaged and it just be encouraged to, uh, to continue reading the Word of God. Some of you have the handout, others don't. Uh, but we're gonna, I'm going to read it out for those of you that are listening uh, so that you can uh, be exposed to, uh, to what we're sharing today as it relates to the book of Philippians. We just wanted to tag it just as a title. Uh, we want to call it Some Reasons for Joy and Rejoicing. Some Reasons for Joy and Rejoicing. How can a believer talk about or even think about joy or rejoicing when they're locked down? This was exactly what Paul the apostle did when he wrote the letter to the church at Philippi from prison. 
Uh, Acts 16 gives the historical background of the origin of this local church, and you can read that on your own. And they were, they were the first European believers of Jesus Christ. Uh, they held a special place in Paul's heart. Although they were very poor monetarily, they, they abounded in liberality. Uh, you know, Paul talked about them in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Uh, then they supported his missionary efforts when, even when other churches were unwilling or unable to do so. And he talks about that at the end of the book of Philippians, chap uh, chapter 4, verse 15. When Paul wrote Philippians, he was in prison awaiting a trial whose outcome could have resulted in his execution. Again, we look at various passages in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, and then also in verse 13 through 14, uh, the same chapter, chapter verse 17, you see it in verse 20, and you also see it in verse 30, and then you see it again in, in chapter 2, verse 17. Scholars debate over whether or not he was in Rome or Ephesus. Well, wherever he was, his imprisonment had led to the furtherance of the gospel among Caesar's palace guards. Just think about that. Paul is in prison. He's locked down. He doesn't have the freedom that he would normally have to go into the synagogue, to go from place to place as he desired to do. But even though he was, he was, he was locked down in prison, he was not shut out by Jesus Christ. And he did not shut himself in to the point that he did not share the gospel. As a matter of fact, when you look at Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 13, he says that to us. He says that so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. When he talks about the, the palace guard, he is talking about the praetorian uh, guards. These were the elite guards. These were, these were the... The, uh, the rangers, these were the SEAL teams of our, of our day and age. These were the very courageous ones who, who literally had the responsibility of guarding, uh, having guard over the Caesar himself. And so, and so Paul, in his being shackled uh, with these guards, uh, they would basically say that there was always um, uh, uh, two to four guards who were always around him. Uh, he was he was a lot of times in shackle, but in this case, he in this in this particular instance, uh, he had a certain uh, freedom where people could visit him and things of that nature. He, you know, he talked about Epaphroditus, one who would come to visit him, those sorts of things that would uh, that would take place. But in reality, he still didn't have his freedom. He couldn't move around, couldn't go around, couldn't do what he was normally doing. But the one thing that he did on a regular basis is that he shared the gospel. Because, because of the joy that he had in Jesus Christ. The theme of joy and rejoicing stands out in this epistle. Five times, the Greek word kara, the Greek word kara, defines delight, delight in something or resulting from some experience. Delight in something or resulting from some experience. The word rejoice is used nine times. Kara is used five times. Rejoice is used nine times. Uh, and the word is karo. That again, that is a verb. Karo meaning to be glad. To be glad for many different reasons. So the question is, how can someone be glad? How can someone delight? How can someone have joy and rejoice when you're locked down? How is that possible? Well, Paul gives us some clues to that. Paul helps us, give, give, gives us some, some uh, uh, answers to that. And again, we're not going to go through the entire book of Philippians, but just uh, uh, some brief clues that we can look at. In chapter 1, Paul's expression of joy was a direct result of his thanksgiving, remembering, praying, and making requests for other believers. I'm going to say it again in chapter 1. Paul's expression of joy was a direct result of his thanksgiving, remembering, praying, and making requests, watch this, for other 
believers. Notice these little clues that we have. I, I, I know in the handout I have chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, but I want you to notice something. Let's just go to verse 1 and just pick up on the clues that would cause Paul to have this, this just this great joy and could just rejoice and be glad and, and, and delight even in, in the fact that he was in a loud lockdown. Pick up the clue in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Did you pick it up? I know you caught it. I know you caught it. Paul uh, and Timothy, bond servants, watch this, Jesus Christ. Just the mere na- mention of his name is a source of joy when you think about it. So now he was said to all the saints in Christ Jesus, another clue why you ought to have joy, who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Again, referring to the pastors and the deacons who were part of, again, other overseers, if you were, who were over the, the church in Philippi. Then he says in verse 2, grace to you and peace from here. It is again, here's some clues. God, our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a clue. That's a, that's a joyous clue to think about God as your father. Oh, my goodness. Remember, uh, early on in the year, we started our, our year off with going through the model prayer. And what did we say? Our father who is in heaven. When we think about the fact that as holy a God as God is, that he allows us to be his children that in itself ought to resonate a certain level of joy in our hearts. Now watch again. He says, I thank my God upon every, look at verse 3, upon every remembrance of you. So what that, what that says is that Paul was saying, first of all, he was, he was, he was in a position of thanks. He was in a position of, of thanksgiving. He was giving thanks to God uh, for for what he had, and he was thinking, giving thanks to God for what he had. What in verse? Go back to verse one. To all the saints, have you ever thought about? Have you ever thought about? And I don't know if that's if that's your that's your experience in life, but 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 I am convinced that most of the people I know, I know them because of Jesus. I know them because of Jesus. And and what I'm learning is that in this season of us kind of being locked down, shut in, safe, you know, working safe from. Uh, work, staying at home or working safe, uh, I'm learning something that there are some people that I've been asking the Lord just to kind of put on my mind. And I give thanks again what, for the, when I think about the church of Jesus Christ and, and what, one of the awesome things that is taking place is that, boy, I tell you, this is such a blessing on Sundays now. Uh, one of the great things that happens, you know, I hear sermons from Virginia. I can hear a sermon from South Carolina. I can, I can, hear, I can hear worship from all different places now that I've not been able to do so uh, because, again, just kind of the way we've been doing things. But I'm recognizing that there are saints in Villeplat and everywhere else that are praising and worshiping God our Father just like we do. So he's giving thanks again for the saints. He's giving, he's remembering them. And that's an important thing. I would just encourage you to do. I don't know how many folk you got in your telephone, but that I would imagine that's somebody you haven't called in a while. That's somebody that you hadn't said hello to in a while. So take time to remember. And one of the things I'm actually asking God to do, Lord, put somebody on my mind that you want me to call today. And so he's remembering them. Again, notice what the, the, the text is also saying. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you. So what he is saying, not only am I giving thanks, not only am I remembering you, but I'm praying for you. I hope, I really hope in this season that we're not being selfish with our prayers, that, that we're praying about me and mine. No, remember, when you think about our, how we're to pray anyway, the model prayer that God has given us, the model prayer for the disciple is, our Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Give us this day. Your, th- so he reminds us that the language of for our prayer is not me or my, our language is our, our language is us. Our language is we. And so we want to keep that in mind. And so, so he's, he's reminding them that he is praying and making, watch this, he says, he's not only just also pray, just praying for them, but he's making requests. He's asking God to see about 
those saints. He's asking God to watch over those saints. He's asking God to take care of those saints. So what that tells me is that he's not being selfish. And I'm guarantee you one of the best ways to experience joy, even in a lockdown, is to not be selfish. <laughs> it's not to be self-centered. It's to think about others, wanting to do for others, concern about others, wanting to help others, seeing about uh, somebody else. Paul expressed that joy as a direct result of thanksgiving, remembering, praying, and making requests for other believers. And notice how he says it. He says it, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all with joy. He said, I get a delight in praying for you. I get a delight in, in, in making requests for you. I get a delight in remembering you. I get delight in giving thanks for you. So anybody that might be in the doldrums today, I'm just telling you, just, just reverse that order. Rather than looking at yourself and complaining about what you don't have, thank God for all the saints God has given you. Thank, thank God for all the folk that you know are saved like you're saved. Thank God for all the folk you know who worship God like you worship God. God. Thank, thank God for those that you know who love God the way you love God. And so especially again in your local church, wherever you may be, you ought to be praying for the members of your church. You ought to be praying for the members of your congregation. Why? Because they are connected to you based upon who? God the Father and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? That is just a, that is a wonderful and glorious thing for us to think about. So here's what I want to do. I want to pause uh, just for a moment. If there's anybody that's listening that uh, would like to, uh, to make some kind of statement, maybe ask a question at this time, feel free to do so, just based upon what we just talked about. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? If you want to do so, I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a, I'm, I got it. I'm going to give a couple of seconds. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? All right, then. And, I, and I'm, learn, I'm noticing some. Some of y'all don't want to be on the air. I think that's what it is. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Y'all want to do it? Feel free to do so. Don't think that you're interrupting in any sense. All right. We're going to keep going on then. So here's the second thing that I want to go to, go to, go to chapter 2 now. In chapter 2, Paul's expectation of joy was in view of all they had in Christ should have resulted in unity within the church. In chapter 2, Paul's expectation of joy was in view of all they had in Christ should have, notice the language now, resulted in unity within the church. Go to chapter 2, look at verse, verse 1 and 2. He says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ. Now, that word, if there, is a, is a different way to put it. It is not with might be, could be. No, Paul is really saying since there is. Uh, therefore, since there's comfort. That's the word encouragement in Christ. Any comfort of love. Any fellowship. That, that's a cool word. That word, kononia, sounds like one of my cousins in Ville Platte. Kononia. Uh, any, any, of, of any fellowship of the Spirit. If any affection and mercy, notice how he describes it. When he looks at what we have, who we have in Christ, and I love that. He says again, he's using the word consolation, encouragement. Listen, in the midst of everything that we're going through, the, the, the people that I know ought to be the most encouraged folk. And the people who ought to be the encouragers of other people, it ought to be us believers. Yes, it ought to be. Why? Because notice what he says. Any encouragement, where is that? In the sphere of Christ. You know, I think, I think that little song says it best for us. When I think about Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul what cries out hallelujah. Thank God for saving me, right? So when we think about the encouragement we have in Christ, and then he says, if any comfort, since there's comfort in him, 
Oh, that's a good word. That's a good word. Because when we think about it, when we think about comfort automatically in our minds, we actually think about the Holy Spirit. We think about the Holy Spirit who lives and abides in us. Jesus, when he was getting ready to leave, he says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send you a comforter. Uh, that, that, that fancy word in the Greek is the word parakletos, one who will come alongside you and he will comfort you. He's going to be your help. We ought to take comfort, if you would, uh, uh, if any comfort of love, and there's no doubt about it, I, 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 would, I would venture to say there's no doubt about it that everybody that's listening right now, you know that God loves you. Oh, yeah, you got to know he loves you. And listen, if you're not a believer, I want to know tell you that he does love you. John 3, 16 actually says this, for God so loved the world. It wasn't just Jews that he loved. It wasn't just Israelites that he loved. It wasn't just Hebrews that he loved, although that was his genealogy. No, no, no. He was telling Nicodemus, hey, man, guess what? You got to have your, your, you gotta have your, your thinking expand much further than what you're coming with. For God so loved the world, talking about people of all kinds all over the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Any, any fellowship of the, whole, of the spirit, again, that, that unity, that kononia, that, that sameness that we have in the Holy Spirit. No. And that's an important thing. We have to remember, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit does live in us. He does abide in us. He does reside in us. And as a result, there ought to be a sameness about us. Yes. Are we individual people? Yeah. Yeah. Do we look different? Yeah. Do our voices? Yeah. The hairstyle? Yeah. All of that make us different. But the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us what? All together. So if you keep that in, your, in, your, in, in mind, if you're a husband and a wife right now, guess what? You have the unity of the spirit. You have, you have the fellowship. You have the colony. You have the commonness. You have the singleness of heart that can make you or that, that, that can lead you, that can help you to think the way that Christ wants you to think, the way that God wants you to think, because that's what we have. We have fellowship of the spirit. And he says, any affection if any affection and mercy, if any affection and mercy, again, that, that, that is that, that inner thing that is within us, that, 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 that part that we can f literally feel things in our gut, if you will, that affection and mercy. So what is he telling us? We have all of this in Jesus Christ. We have all of this in God our Father. So as a result, when we view it from the standpoint of Jesus, recognizing all that we have in Jesus Christ, notice what he is saying in verse 2. Fulfill my joy. Fulfill my joy. Paul, Paul has given at least an indication that things are not as well as they ought to be in the Philippian church. There's, is, things are not as strong as it should be in view of Jesus Christ. So he says, fulfill, he's making a request in a sense, fulfill my joy. Yeah, fulfill my joy. Um, uh, fulfill my joy. Make it complete because I know you can, but you have to, but you have to, in order for that to be, if you would, like-mindedness, in order for you to have the same love, in order for you to be in one accord, in order for you to have that one mind, you got to think about Jesus. You got to put on what the mind of Christ. And so when you do that, when you think about all that you have in Christ, the potential for unity, the potential for us to get along with each other, even though everybody is at home at the same time, the potential for us to get along with one another is there because of what we have in Christ. And if anybody's saying today, I can't really, I just can't do it, Pastor. I just, I just can't do it. I'm, I'm telling you, you can do everything you can through Jesus Christ. But you got to think about Jesus. If you just think about your circumstance, if you just look at what you're going through, if you just look at your own personal experience, no, you will never, ever come to a point that there's unity and oneness and the sameness of mind. You'll never, ever get there. But when you think about Jesus... Wow, he has a way again of, of causing what, as Paul would say, fulfill my joy. And Paul had the expectation of that joy. He knew it was possible. He knew it could be done. He knew 
He knew we had the potential to bring, or he would say to the church at Philippi, I know you all have the potential to bring great joy. And I'm going to just say it to you all as your pastor. I love y'all so dearly. And I know y'all have the potential to bring pastor some joy by loving on each other and taking care of each other. And, and if you got some, if you're at odds with one another, right now is a good time to say, I love you, forgive me, do all of those things. that Because I know that you can. So I'm asking you, like Paul would say to the church at Philippi, fulfill my joy by what? By being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of what? And of one mind. And he would tell us, I mean, I'm just, I, 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 I don't have it in the handout, but let me just look at those verses. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Don't be trying to have it in your way right now. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Boy, I tell you, that's, good. that's an experience of joy that you never, ever can imagine. If you stop thinking so much about yourself and start thinking about others and wanting to help others and esteem others, it says, let each of you not look out, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Everybody in the house don't want to play. Every, everybody, everybody, watch this. If all you want to play is Monopoly, Understand that there's somebody else that want to play something else. So you, you be willing to play some other game with them. If, so, if everybody in the house, everybody in the house don't want to watch the same program that you want to watch, please let them watch some of the things that they want to watch. Can I get a witness in here? Somebody, listen, every now and then, give up that seat you've been sitting in for the last six weeks. Let somebody else sit in that seat. Can I get a just, just things that we could do to what? To show interest in somebody else other than ourself. All right. Well, I'm going to pause again. Any question? Any comment? Uh, especially those, again, at the conference call, if you push star six, it'll allow you to, uh, to come in. So if you want to do that, please, ma'am, please, sir, don't hesitate. All right. I hear you, Brother Leonard, okay? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is given through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. And so we always want to keep in mind that, that the goal there, as, as Berlina was saying, is that when we look at the book of Philippians, it's a reminder again of the love that, that will generate joy within us if we're willing to give it up. But if we're willing to be selfish, we can't experience again the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's keep moving on. Chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3 now. Go to chapter 3. In chapter 3, notice what he says. In chapter 3, Paul's exhortation to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ was the antidote. Notice the word now. He says he expect, we, had the ex, we had the expression of joy in chapter 1. We had the expectation of joy in chapter 2. But now we've got the exhortation to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Was the antidote for self-applause. Go to chapter 3. Look at, start at verse 1. Finally, my br brethren, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, uh, but for you it is safe. The reason Paul is saying that, because he recognizes in the church at Philippi, you got Judaizers that are there, and they want, you know, they big on circumcision, and they big on maintaining the Jewish way of life, Judaism and the like. And these were Gentiles, and they didn't know anything about it, so Paul is giving them advance warning to let them know, I know that the Judaizers are going to come, and they're going to try to steer you away from your belief in Jesus Christ. But Here's, what he, what, what, here's how he referred to them in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit 
Again, when he uses circumcision there, he's using it in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's reminding them of the Jewish practice, but he's more so talking about the cleansing of the heart, the cleaning of the, the human heart that has now transpired through the saving work of Jesus Christ. He is not talking about the physical cutting of the skin as far as circumcision was to the Jew. No, what he is talking about is, is, the, is the cutting away of sin as it relates to the relationship now that they had because of Jesus Christ. He says, he says, for we are, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice, he says, in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Thou also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Why do you say that, Paul? Um, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Oh, man, he is talking about what his Jewish pedigree. Oh, we. And so now what Paul recognizes is that there's a group of folk who are coming into the church, some leaders who are coming into the church, disturbing the Gentiles wherever they, they are, and basically they are promoting themselves. They give themselves self-applause. Look at me. Look at what I have done. Look at what I have accomplished. Look at who I am. And today, it might not be that we do it from a stand of Judaism, but sometimes it can just be within our own self. I mean, I love myself better than I love myself. And really, I don't love nobody else more than I love myself, if that making any sense. And so now, what he's saying, what, 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 what Paul would say in this case, it would be us bragging on the house I got, the car I drive, how much money I got in the bank. You know, my 401k, uh, you know, my family is this, my daughter is this, my son is this, and, you know, we all of that, and a bag of potato chips, some Snickers bars, and some Coca-Cola on the side. You know, we all of that. Paul is saying that none of that matters, none of that matters, because notice again, when I'm looking at the handout, you know, the, the last thing that he says, or the second, the, the, the second part on that second sentence, if you would, on chapter 3, he saw attaining the knowledge of Christ as the highest achievement. Notice what Paul said concerning, again, I'm going at verse 6, just as a reminder, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. What Paul would say, he could say that he was blameless because when it came to the law, Paul would say he wasn't claiming that he was sinless, but he would say, when I did mess up, I offered the proper sacrifice so that my sin could be forgiven. So based upon the law, he was saying he was blameless. But notice what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Oh, my God. All of my own personal uh, rewards, my own personal acclamation, my own self-applause. He said, I counted all loss for Christ. Yet, verse 8, eight indeed, I also count all things, all things loss for the excellence, here it is, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Why, Paul, would you do that? That I may gain Christ. Oh, my God. Listen, God knows I am not in any way discouraging folk from getting education. I'm not discouraging from getting a good job. I'm not discouraging from having a nice home. I'm not discouraging riding in a nice car. I'm not discouraging that at all. But make sure that ain't all. Because the most important thing that you and I can do is to attain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, my goodness. That, 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 that's awesome. You know, I think about, I think about my mom sometimes. I know, never should forget some years ago. Uh, I went, went to visit my mom, and, and she's looking at me. She said, son, she said, ooh, she said, I'm, I'm very proud of you. She said, babe, I wish I, could, I wish I could read and know the Bible like you. You know, and, I, and of course, my, my mom had a limited education, limited ability to read and all of that. And I understood, I understood what she was saying. So I said, I say, Mom, I say, listen, I say, okay, you've had, you've had, you've been under, under three pastors or four pastors before me. You, you knew about Reverend Ben, 
Uh, you knew about Reverend M.L. Thomas. When we came to Houston, we were under Reverend M.L. Johnson. I say, then you serve under Reverend Wilson. I say, and now, quote, unquote, I'm your fifth pastor. I say, now, here's my question. You know, from Reverend Ben all the way to me, when you hear a lesson, when you hear the preaching of the gospel, when you hear us saying what you ought to go home and do, to be a wife or to be a mother, uh, to be a missionary, that kind of thing that you all were, were doing back then. I said, when you, when you would hear that, I say, do you know how to do that? Are you willing to do that? She looked at me almost like in a way of disgust and disgust, like, yes. You know, like, boy, what are you talking about? You know, but the thing was, and that's the point I said to mom, I said, but that's it, mom. It's not whether or not you, we can read it all. It's not whether or not we can explain it all. It's not whether or not we can interpret it all. The issue is whether we're willing to obey it all because now to gain the knowledge of Christ, it comes with obedience. It comes with, with faithfulness to him. It's not just a matter of talking about what I know. It's what I do with the knowledge that I have. Y'all remember I told y'all this before. I sat in a seminary class uh, some years ago. And I guess at that point, I was about 46, so 46, somewhere around there. And there's a youngster sitting in the class. He's 24 years old. You know, he just blonde, head, blue eyed, just cool cat. And he stood in the class, and i never forget that statement. He said, I don't know about you all, but I am educated beyond my level of obedience. i like, man, I need to get up out of this class right now. Because what he was saying, I know more than what I do. And, and, and brothers and sisters, I think that's a reality for most of us. But what Paul is saying, I got to be willing to give up. I got to be willing to see none of that as important as attaining the knowledge of Jesus Christ. My job, I can, I'm, I, it, it doesn't matter if I'm in six figures. My car, it doesn't matter if it's the best car around. My education, if it doesn't matter that I've attained the highest level of education that I possibly can attain. He says, nothing else of it measures to attaining the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Just nothing better than that, brothers and sisters. And that's what Paul says. That's why he told the church. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, man. He said, be glad in the Lord. Why? Because when you know what God knows, when you know what Jesus knows, that makes you the smartest person in the world. That makes you the most intelligent person in the world. It just the higher, that's the highest level of knowledge that a person can possibly attain is to know what Jesus knows. So that ought to be our goal. That ought to be our goal. That ought to be our goal. It ought to be to attain but to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And here's the final thing in chapter 4. Uh, Paul's exhortation to rejoice in the Lord always Rejoice in the Lord always would be evident. He would, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yes. To rejoice in the Lord always would be evident in the consistency and constancy of their attitudes and action. I'm going to say it again. Chapter 4. Paul's exhortation to rejoice in the Lord always would be evident in the consistency and constancy of their attitudes and actions. Notice again verse 4 of chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I know when you read that, somebody is saying, Pastor, man, it's a coronavirus out there, COVID-19. What you talking about rejoice? As a matter of fact, this, this, is, this is in the grammar. It's called an imperative. And it's, in, it's, a, it's a present imperative and it's active, meaning I ought to do it right now. It has nothing to do with outside circumstances. It has nothing to do with with how people treated me on the outside. It has nothing to do with, with, with what I have, what I don't have. It has everything to do with a decision that I make based upon my love for Jesus Christ. I am going to rejoice. And watch this. Sometime in rejoicing in the Lord, <laughs> that, that, you know, I guess, again, not, not, that, uh, not that I'm, uh, you know, not that I'm 60. I mean, I'm recognizing it's some pains and light. I mean, some pains in my body. I never thought I would have. I just, I just, you know, you know, and so every now and then I'm like, oh, 
oh, you know, like, where did that come from? But, but I'm recognizing it's just pains that come up. But guess what? It doesn't matter how bad the pain is. The Lord is saying, rejoice, Lee. Matter of fact, be glad. Why, Lord, why am I glad that I got pain? Because you can feel it. Ooh. <laughs> You know, I, just the mere fact, you can feel it. Well, Lee, well, Lee, well, Lee, I hear what you're saying, but what about, what about, I'm existing. I'm still in this world. I still got people around me. I still got doctors and nurses that are seeing about, what, what, there's no circumstance whatsoever that says to us there come a time that as a believer, I shouldn't rejoice. There's never a time I shouldn't be glad because if nothing else, when I think about Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of Jesus Christ and what I have in Jesus Christ, I have forgiveness, right? I have been redeemed, yes. I have the Holy Spirit living and abiding in me. I have all, all of my needs met. He is my father. I am his child. I got all of those blessings that are attached to it. And he is saying, if worst case scenario for you, Lee Skinner, is that you might die, guess what? I've taken care of that problem too. To be absent from the body is to be present with me. Lee, I got it all figured out for you. So you might as well what? Rejoice! You might as well rejoice! And notice again, I love that verse, I mean, because Paul is repeating it. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, always. And again, I say, rejoice. What? 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 But Pastor, how am I going to do that? Paul, how am I going to do that? Well, here are some things that he says that 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 be necessary. When we talk about our attitude and our actions, that needs to be a constancy. That needs to be consistency. Notice what he says in verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Yeah, don't be, don't be out there demanding your rights right now. And listen, and this is true. This is, this is, this is very, very true. This is very, very true. Uh, I went, I went uh, 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 Monday night, Monday, Monday evening, um, and I got to be honest with y'all, it's the first time I've gone to Whataburger this year. Um, hadn't gone at all this year. My first time going this year. And I went there that m- Monday night, and uh, the, when, we, when it got to the place, there was this car that, couldn't, well, you know, th- you know, they're not in a lot of anybody go in. So there was a car that wasn't running. And so it had blocked the traffic. So I went around, you know, over there by the Home Depot lot. And then I turned around, came back to the Waterberg place. And then when I, as I'm doing that, I'm turning, I, I, I go around, I'm getting ready to turn to come get in line with everybody else. Well, there's a car that, that goes kind of on the side of where they had been working, where they had been blocked in. And, and I get in line before the guy, and as we're getting ready to get in line, I, I see in my rearview mirror the guy jump out of his car. He jumps out of his car, and he's telling me, hey, man, I was in line before you. I said, no, dude, no, you weren't. No, you weren't. I, I, I saw you. I said, but you saw. I was turning around as you were coming up. I said, so, I said, no, I, you, you, were, you, were not, you were not before me. Man, yes, I was. Yes, I said, hey, man, listen, hey, it's a... It's a it's, it's not that crucial. I tell you what, here's what you do. You go get in line. Go ahead and get in line in front of me. Go, go, man, go ahead. Help yourself. You know, you know why? Because here's what I wanted to be understood. That although I could demand my right that it was, no, he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? The Lord is at hand. So I'm not, I, I didn't, I didn't want to dishonor God by having an argument going back and forth with this guy. Because guess what? I was going to get my food five minutes after him anyhow. So he's saying, let your gentleness be known. Now watch this. As a result of doing that, guess what? I got some joy in me. I am glad it didn't turn out to be a mess. It didn't turn out to be a big hassle. They didn't have to call the cops. Nobody had to to, to call. Gentleness is 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 an expression again of that joy. Then he says it in verse 6, and most of us know that verse. We're about done. He says, be anxious for nothing. Remember what I told y'all Dr. Harry Leaf used to say, what is, what is nothing, Lee? He would, draw, he would draw a circle on a whiteboard, and then he'd take a, an eraser and erase it off. He says, uh, 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 nothing is a zero with the size rubbed off. When he says be anxious for nothing, he means worry about nothing. But notice what he says. But in everything, by prayer. Worry about nothing but what? 
pray about everything. And supplication says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. There needs to be a consistency. There needs to be a constancy about that. And then he reminds us, and the peace of God, that's the promise, that's the result which surpasses all understanding, will do what will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, my brethren, that's something that Shield just quoted this morning. Um, uh, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's any, any, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Oh, thank you, brother. Luther P. Rott. P. Rod used to remind us every time he had a chance to talk that he had to meditate on the word of God, meaning that you got to think it through. You got to, you got to, you got to read God's word, but you got to think it through. How's this going to work in my life today? How's this, how, how, how should the word of God work in this particular situation at this particular time? So he says, meditate on these things. He says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, this is the apostle Paul, do, and the God of peace will be with you. I, my hope and prayer is that in some way, somehow, even as, as your pastor, I've been in enough of an example to even say, be able to say what Paul said. Uh, these things you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace what will be with you. Now, when we do that, that's, that's why we say that there are some reasons for joy and rejoicing. Because when we, when we, when we learn something, when we receive what we, what we learn, and when we, we hear it and we can see it as an example in somebody else, the Bible says that we ought to, what, imitate, Paul said, imitate me, what, as I imitate Christ. And so God has given you somebody for you to look at, somebody that you can mirror, somebody that you can, you can imitate, somebody that, that lives in such a way that you would say, you know, I like the way he does, I like the way she does that, this, that, and the other. So I would encourage us today to know that, that we got some reasons for joy and rejoicing. So regardless of our circumstances, joy and rejoicing should be the reality of followers of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Beloved, I pray that God continue to bless and keep all of us, give us direction, give us purpose for life, and uh, that we would adhere to those things that he has said in his word. Good Shepherd, I do want to encourage you to do this. Uh, it's another first Sunday, and so I'm going to ask that you would prepare for the Lord's table as you see fit in doing it. Get you some grape juice, if you will. Get you some crackers. I have those available for Sunday morning. And after the sermon, we will share in the communion experience again. Father, thank you so much for allowing us this privilege to be with each other in this vein. More than anything else, help us now to have both express joy and rejoicing in the sphere of Jesus Christ in this day and the days that are yet beyond us. We ask it all in Christ's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much. I love you all. Until we meet again. God be with us. Y'all take care, Good Shepherd. Take care of my friends, all of you that are listening, no matter where you're listening. God bless.